The 2007 film Zodiac is based on the mysterious California criminal in the 60s and 70s, but interestingly leaves certain crime scenes out of the movie, like the first incident which took place in December of 1968 on Lake Herman Road in Benicia. The movie simply opens with the second confirmed case, the July 4th, 1969 ordeal in Blue Rock Springs, but in each crime scene that follows, we only see certain details about the Zodiac. This isn't just done to build suspense and make the movie scary, there is a specific reason that director David Fincher held back information the way that he did. This was the director's first foray into non-fiction, and given the ongoing nature of the case, he wanted to make the movie as accurate as possible. So the motivation for every Zodiac appearance was to base it off the testimony of surviving witnesses. The Lake Herman Road shooting had no survivors, and so was mentioned but never shown in the movie. The Blue Rock Springs affair had one survivor, and the Zodiac is shown covered in shadow with a light shining in our faces to fit the circumstances of that July 4th. Night. The Lake Berryessa stabbing in September of that year also had a survivor, and we see the Zodiac dressed up to hide his identity as described by the living victim. And the Presidio Heights occurrence doesn't give the viewer any information that the kids who called in the felony wouldn't have been able to see for themselves. This was done to ensure that the filmmakers were sticking to the truth. The first confirmed victims were a couple who both died in 1968, so the filmmakers don't really have an account of the events. So in order to create the scene on film, they would have had to make stuff up. To see other examples of the painstaking dedication to accuracy and the meaning behind some of the many posters that appear, stick around to the end of this video. Welcome to Things You Missed. I believe this is the first non-fiction episode of Things You Missed. The only partial exception would be the Conjuring franchise movies, which are still fictional stories, but they are based on real-life characters. So far, Zodiac is the only movie I've covered that adapts only real-life events. The obvious reason is that this is a horror channel, and it's often considered to be rude to turn someone's real-life horrors into popcorn cinema. But Zodiac does an excellent job of being accurate, respectful, and still having kills that are very suspenseful and scary. Not many people have basements in California. I do. In fact, it does much better than many fictional horror movies. I mean, I'm not gonna name any names. Not gonna name The Turning. Not gonna name Black Christmas 2019. Not gonna name Countdown. Definitely not gonna name Brightburn. <laughs> The depictions of the Zodiac weren't the only aspects where extreme attention to accuracy was paid. The opening logos of the film are reminiscent of the logos used by those studios during the 60s, complete with dust and scratches on the film to make it feel as if we're watching an old movie. The wardrobe department used all available information to recreate what each victim was wearing, and I quickly figured this out throughout the movie. All of the newspapers seen on camera are real prints from the Zodiac investigation. In the far corner, there's a stack of the day's newspapers in the San Francisco Chronicle, and there is in the in the movie, too. You could walk onto the set, pick up, like, the third newspaper from a stack of 20 at the bottom, open up to page 37, and read the article that was in the Chronicle that day. The production had access to information that the general public did not, so it's not always obvious how much care was taken to get these things right. But one scene where it was obvious was the infamous Melvin Belli broadcast, where the Zodiac demanded that the prominent attorney appear on the talk show AM San Francisco. Fincher's approach was not just to make an entertaining movie, but also to create a competent piece of journalism. After reading the script, which is based on the main character Robert Gray Smith's book, which we can actually see on the shelves in the latter half of the movie, Fincher wanted to go even deeper and meets the surviving victims in the investigation for the purposes of maintaining authenticity and journalistic integrity. In a way, the movie, in its pursuit of getting all of the little details right, became the ultimate knowledge database for details about the case. As we see in the film, part of the obstacle that prevented the case from being solved was that you had several different different police departments with jurisdiction over certain areas who didn't always communicate and share the info with each other as well as they could have. The next one isn't necessarily a thing you missed in the movie, but it's definitely something that you wouldn't know if you had just watched the movie. We see at the end the aftermath. In 2004, the San Francisco Police Department deactivated their Zodiac investigation. The movie Zodiac was released on March 2nd, 2007, and that same month, the case was reopened in San Francisco, where it remains open today. If you are curious, the biggest update came in 2018 where some of the letters sent into the newspapers were sent to a lab where it was thought that some new forensic testing could match the DNA from the back of the stamps. However, as of 2020, still no results have been reported. I do find it somewhat ironic that a movie would be what theoretically reopened the case in San Francisco because one of the theories about Zodiac was that he was a big fan of movies and pop culture, leading the detectives at one point to go after a suspect named Rick Marshall who worked at movie theaters on two separate occasions. The Zodiac Killer is obsessed with movies. He recorded his murders on film. I tried to tell the police, but they wouldn't follow through on it. What? What?
No, no, I, I wasn't alive in the 60s. What? I, I swear. It is at one point suggested that the zodiac symbol could be related to the crosshair imagery seen in a film leader. And Graysmith makes a connection in which one of zodiac ciphers appears to reference a film called The Most Dangerous Game, in which a hunter goes after humans for sport. Zodiac is also rich with cinema references, most notably to one in 1971 action flick called Dirty Harry. This is about a movie about a couple of killers, Harry Callahan and a homicidal maniac. The one with the badge is Harry. It's loosely based on the Zodiac murders with an antagonist named Scorpio, which is one of the 12 Zodiac signs, who sends threats to the San Francisco Chronicle. There are so many connections here. I hope that the use of a crosshair symbol was not lost on you. Dirty Harry also takes place in San Francisco and in a Zodiac featurette. The screenwriter James Vanderbilt suggests that Dirty Harry was actually based on Detective Dave Toskey, the real life version of the Mark Ruffalo character. Mark was able to sort of bring that wonderful humanity that you don't expect to find in the guy who Bullet was based on and Dirty Harry was based on. And the diner where Toski likes to eat in Zodiac is called Callahan's Diner. Harry Callahan. And the movie that Toski goes to see where he first meets Robert Graysmith, Dirty Harry. A poster can be seen as he exits the cinema. Then, at the last scene that Graysmith and Toski share together in Callahan's Diner, there's this line. Just because you can't prove it doesn't mean it's not true. Easy, Dirty Harry. There would be even more significant movie references in Zodiac that the Zodiac himself would probably be proud of, but those wouldn't be the only connections and things you missed yet to come. In Robert Graysmith's book, he describes the crimes in great detail, but doesn't really talk about his personal life or the reason he becomes so obsessed with the case. In the movie, we see the sad evolution of his personal life, and if you're paying close attention, there is a suggestion about why he becomes so fascinated with Zodiac. It seems that Graysmith, or at least the movie version of Graysmith, may have been a crime movie buff. Here we see a poster in his living room for Alfred Hitchcock's The Wrong Man. Nearby is a poster of John Huston's The Asphalt Jungle. Behind the couch is a poster for the 1955 crime flick I Died a Thousand Times. By the door, he's got a poster for the 1955 movie Illegal. As we know, one of Graysmith's strongest assets isn't his movie knowledge, but his knowledge of books. By the phone is a series of book covers for the original James Bond stories by Ian Fleming, which I realize may fall more under action Action, but they definitely still have aspects of the crime genre. At one point, Robert suggests the idea of tracking books that Zodiac may have used to develop the code used in his ciphers. I started thinking that if you can track these books, then maybe you can track the man. We've seen this tactic used once before in a crime movie directed by David Fincher, and the crime I'm referring to is not stealing the idea for an $800 billion website. I'm talking about Seven, where we see Detective Somerset, who similarly tries to solve a themed serial killer case by using library records. Ask yourself, hey, wait, wait. What would he study to do the things he's done? What are his interests now? Dr. Ripper, for instance. Library. Obviously that came out before Zodiac, but Zodiac is based on events that happened before Seven n So I wonder if Fincher was already an enthusiast of the Zodiac case before he made Seven n and that's what inspired him to put in that plot point. Supposedly Fincher was the first name that they went to about directing Zodiac because he had already made the definitive serial killer film. There's also a possible reference to another Fincher film, a much sillier one. Let's roll the clip. Right up. Now a question of etiquette. As I pass, do I give you the ass or the crunch? This can't be a coincidence, right? Dave. It can't be a coincidence. Well, there's one thing that's definitely not a coincidence in this. In the background of the scene at the police station, there's a cameo appearance from Brian C. Hartnell, the real-life survivor of the Lake Berryessa attack who can be seen as an adult in the documentary, This is the Zodiac Speaking. Another possible pattern in the Zodiac case that gets brought up in the film and book is that each of the attacks that Zodiac has proven his involvement in have some kind of connection to a body of water. Lake Herman Road, Blue Rock Springs, Lake Berryessa, which was actually a reservoir, but still water, and then Washington and 
and Cherry, the weakest example of the bunch. So there are also aquatic references in the movie, like Graysmith's favorite adult beverage being something called Aqua Velva, the first shot of the film looking out over the water, and a poster in the movie theater organist's house for Key Largo, a crime slash noir movie set next to the ocean in Key Largo, Florida. As I mentioned before, one of the frustrating parts of this case was that years and years would go by where nothing new would happen. And I think this stagnation is symbolized perfectly when Graysmith eventually goes to visit his old pal, Paul Avery, and finds him in the middle of a game of Pong. Instead of pausing it, the game continues to run, with neither side making a move the entire time. The film's ending, like the real case, doesn't offer much closure to the plot, but I find that the film does give closure for a couple of the characters. Graysmith at one point tells his wife that it'll be over when he's able to look the Zodiac in the eye and know that it's him. In the book, the hardware store scene is a mission to try to gather more information about Arthur Lee Allen, primarily to get a real handwriting sample when he doesn't suspect it, but in the movie, all we see is the eye contact between Graysmith and Allen. The smile slowly disappearing from his face as he realizes who this visitor is. The very last scene provides closure for another character, and it brings the entire movie full circle. The first character to appear on screen was Mike Majot, and 22 years later, after pointing out the man that forever changed his life, he would be the last character to appear before a cut to black. The end credits music is the same music that they listened to on the radio that night. While we may never know for sure who the Zodiac Killer was, this scene tells us that for the oldest confirmed survivor, the case was closed. But as one case closes, another one opens here on Things You Missed, because in the next episode I'll be wrapping up my series of David Fincher analyses with my personal favorite, Sorry Zuck, It's Gone Girl. Remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one, assuming we stay inside.